Welcome back. How about starting the big stories with that story of hope? These are people out there, even in the circumstances we find ourselves, they find that silver lining behind the dark cloud. Well, we're back getting into the all-important matter of government asking bondholders to accept a nominal haircut of as much as 40%. Now, this is after some government bonds took a nosedive. They slumped. And Finance Minister Ken Oforiata disclosed that Ghana had submitted a debt reworking proposal containing huge haircuts on both principles and interests. But what exactly does Ghana want? What will be the implications of all of this on the pot of our economy? Today on the AM Show, we engage our analysts. We have Professor Lord Mensa, Associate Professor of Finance at the University of Ghana Business School. We also have Professor John Gachi, Dean, UCC School of Business. But to help us situate the conversation. My right-hand man when it comes to these matters, Isaac Kofi J, data analyst at Joy News. Isaac, do you see how happy you've made me? Do you see how I'm smiling? <laughs> good morning, man. Good morning. And uh, to Prof and Prof, a very good morning to you both. Good yeah, morning. If you can hear me. Yes, and uh, the distinct baritone of uh, Prof on the other side. Are, are you on the UCC campus, Prof? Professor Gachi? Yes. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to hear the baritone one more time. I mean, that, that mood is funny. <laughs> but, but to situate the conversation, Kofi, so what does all of this mean? 40%. That's quite a haircut. But break it down for our viewers into bite-sized pieces. What does this really mean? Well, so Ghana is looking for not just 40% um, haircut on principle. So be we are requesting between... 30 to 40 percent on principal and not uh, not more than five percent on e interest and if you look at our external debt portfolio the euro bond portion is actually the biggest so i was looking through the 2022 uh, debt reports and as of 2022 we still had outstanding euro bonds worth some 13.5 billion dollars and if you look at the presentation that the finance minister did uh, in Washington uh, at the beginning of the year uh, to external creditors, uh, you realize that uh, Ghana targeted about $20.5 billion that we want to restructure. Of this target, the actual amount that we want to restructure or get fiscal space from is about $10.5 billion. But looking at uh, our current debt obligation or debt servicing uh, for 2023 which is estimated around uh, three billion dollars that is the reason why we need and that's just on interest ben. and so if you look at the interest that we have to actually pay to eurobond creditors um, 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 and other loans uh, Kofi, have, Kofi, please hold for me i i do not know whether um prof um professor mensa or professor gachi has not un, uh, has muted or not unmuted because I'm getting feedback. But but thank you, thank you very much. If you could just mute for me so we don't get that feedback. Mm. Kofi, please go ahead. Yeah. So the the huge, um, you know, debt servicing obligation that we have just on interest and other charges that we have to pay for 2023 has actually necessitated this. And so if you look at the IMF program, we have to do a debt restructuring at the external level to win us. Uh, fiscal breathing space of about 10.5 billion over the course of the program. But 30 to 40 percent simply tells you that the government is saying um, the outstanding euro bond that they have, which is 13 billion, they will not be able to probably pay everything. And so they want a debt relief. So debt relief means that they want the creditors to write off about 30 to 40 percent of the debt. And the loans that they took, if you look at the average interest rates of the loans is between a six to 11%. And so if you are looking for a 5% haircut uh, on interest too as well, it simply tells you that government wants a reduction in the interest. And they are doing this so that uh, they can continue with their debt serv uh, servicing obligation. They are doing this so that they don't find themselves wanting where the the the, um, the small liquidity that they have in terms of foreign exchange, they wouldn't use everything to make you know uh, service debts and then also pay interest. And so the eurobond 
is a crucial aspect of this whole debt restructuring. And it comes with this, um, you know, complex and sophisticated, uh, you know, um, legal systems around it. It's not, it's not like the DDEP that we did where government had, was able to take unilateral decisions. This time around, you need to engage creditors at various levels. Uh, after Eurobond, which is the commercial aspect, you need to engage bilateral creditors. You need to engage big countries like China. You need to engage groups like the Paris Club as well. And so, Ben, if you ask me, 30 to 40 percent, today I was just reading on Reuters, and uh, some of the creditors have already shown signs of not, you know, taking such a significant haircut. It's very, very huge. It means that whatever debt that you have with government, whatever principle that you have with government, you are willing to take a haircut of 40 percent, reduce the value or the actual amount by uh, between 30 to 40 percent, and then also expect less uh, from your coupon payment uh, when government is in a good position to start paying. Isaac, hold for me. Let me bring in Professor Lord Mensa onto this. Uh, we knew this was coming at some point, but did you, were you looking at 40%? Does, did this take you by surprise? Um, you, you, good morning to our viewers once again. Uh, mm. Good morning to my co-panelists. You know, government has a target in the entire, you know, restructuring. And uh, the, the entire restructuring, they're looking at around $10.5 billion, you know, dollars. And if you look at the domestic restructuring, the recent uh, presentation that was done by the finance minister, um, he gave the signal that they are saving around 61 billion Ghana cities. In, a, in dollar terms, that is about, you know, 5 billion, 5 point something billion. So that covers about half of, you know, the target government is looking out for. And then if you are to take the external, you know, euro bond structure into play, you come to understand that we're looking at as of last year around 13.5 billion, 5% 5 of that in nominal terms. I'm not going to talk about the, the what we call the, 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 the coupons and all those. 5% of that is around 5.2%. You know, so when you put that the two together, you get a 10.5 that you know, um, um, government is 10.5 billion that government is looking out for. So it has to do with a target. And of course, this is an offer on the table. And uh, being an offer on the table, you don't expect the investor to respond, you know, 100% to say that we are going to accept, you know, your offer. The investor also has a say. This has to do with negotiations. Unlike, you know, the domestic market where government had control, more or less, where the investors' alternative, you know, use of funds was quite limited, and as a result of that, government pushed down, you know, most of the, the most of the uh, what the conditions down the throat of the investor. But then the external creditors' position is different. Government the approach that government adapted in our environment, they cannot use the same, you know, approach because over there, you know, they understand the investment space very well and. You know, they have alternative use of their funds. And of course, even though they've enjoyed certain premiums over the years, if you take, you know, um, the time we're giving them 6 to 11%, um, the Americans and all those were giving 1% there about. So these investors have been enjoying about, you know, 5 to, you know, 10% risk premium over the past years. And so, Having understood the risk that they were going in for and the premium they've enjoyed, they, I believe they will be prepared to come to the table. But to the, to the tune of the 40%, like I said, it has to do with the target our government has. It may not achieve, you know, that 40%. But let's see how the investors are going to react. Now, if you study out the market the, 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 from Bloomberg this morning, if you study the market, Investors have started reacting, you know, by, you know, pulling out, you know, their investment in the government bonds. And as a result of that, you know, we've seen uh, some downwards, I mean, spiral in the price of, of the bond. So effectively, it has to do with the target of the government and what the investor is looking out for. If you are to go for restructuring, and this time I've, I've heard the finance minister, you know, being careful not to use the restructuring word, he said, uh, what, debt rework. You know, so you're going to work on the debt again. And uh, 
working on a debt again, whichever way you look at it, it has to do with haircut. And I believe that the investor community um, will respond as such. You know, we're not going to struggle that much from the external market because they know, they understand the investment. They have invested to the tune of looking at, okay, fine. Um, as an experienced investor, I understand there are losses in investment. But the question is, what is my extreme loss? Those are the caliber of investors government is going to deal with. They appreciate the investment dynamic. All like our environment where some of the investors were even thinking that, you know, government bonds, you never, you never default, government will never default. And uh, they were, they were taking it as a risk-free instrument, which is counter to what we teach in class. I mean, where I teach, I mean, my, when I'm teaching, I tell the students that, look, once the dynamics of the bond is dictated by demand and supply of funds, definitely there's, there's an exposure. And with this exposure, whatever, even treasury bills, you should appreciate that there's that kind of what, you know, levels of risk in there. So um, the investor community that we are now going to deal with, which is the external investor, right. is quite substantiated. They appreciate, you know, um, the investment dynamics. And at this time, they are counting their losses by the extreme side. You mm. know? Yeah, they are counting their losses by the extreme side. So um, we can get a deal with them. I mean, I don't think we're going to struggle that much as compared to what, what happened in the domestic market. Let me bring in Professor Gachi. How did you receive this news? And 40%, that's pretty hefty. Uh, Professor Mensah has already spoken about the boons they enjoyed in the good times. But will they be willing to accept a haircut of up to 40%? And what will this mean for us in terms of borrowing in the future? John is muted. Really? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Well, I think the whole issue about debt exchange program or reworking of debt uh, is based on the fact that you have a creditor uh, who must decide what should happen. Uh, you need to appeal to the conscience. You need to appeal to uh, the creditor community to accept your position. So right. I believe it's going to be uh, a discussion and negotiation uh, that will come to some agreement at a point. Right. Uh, but uh, the point is for a, a creditor, especially a external creditor, to accept that I want to lose 40% of my principal and lose 5% of my uh, um, interest. Uh, that that creditor should be convinced that indeed the the government is not actually in position to pay the debt. Then number two, uh, if the debt is not paid, uh, which one is the best for the uh, for the creditor? So by that discussion, maybe a middle way will be found along the line for agreement. So that is how it is. So it, so you may have your target, but your target cannot be imposed on the creditor. Uh, you may you may want to save your currency by ensuring that the amount of money you are paying to creditors uh, is reduced uh, to to give some respite to the currency. Uh, you may want to re uh, uh, work your your debt books uh, to let the the books look good by setting some target, but those target they are just, they are not legally binding. Uh, those targets are not uh, the conclusion. So I believe this is just the first step. Uh, we have seen uh, creditors reacting negatively to that call. So the government should be aware and then uh, think about uh, what to put on the table next. But I believe the 40% uh, is not in the interest of creditors. That's what they are, right, uh, they are reacting. So you say it's not in the interest of creditors. How do you expect the creditors to react? They have they've started reacting <laughs> negatively. Uh, we saw what is happening was reported at least uh, I think yesterday when the announcement came. Mm. Uh, so the bonds start plummeting. Uh, so that is a, that is the uh, signal they are sending. So 
I, I believe further negotiation is needed. This is not the end of the of the negotiation process. Let me let and, me quickly and, bring and in, we might, and, and we must also not forget that uh, a, a creditor, le, uh, I mean borrower relationship, is rooted in law. Indeed. Uh, so if yes, yes, it's rooted in law, because you are taking this money and promise them that you will be able to pay when <laughs> uh, the maturity comes. You'll be able to pay uh, the, the coupons their own on the debt that is an agreement that you have signed you must go by the agreement if you can't go by the agreement you cannot impose your way on the agreement just because you cannot pay because if you cannot pay there are many 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 ways by which the creditor can take that money from you so convincing the creditor is the way to go but just setting your target and imposing that target on the creditor is as though you don't want the creditor support, and you cannot do that the way you do it in, uh, I mean, in the domestic debt exchange. When you do that in the external uh, creditor uh, community, uh, you will fail. Uh, thank you for those interesting points. Uh, Isaac, just a quick one to run by you. You've heard Professor Gachi say that 40% is not in the interest of the creditors. The creditors will always work in their interest. They may accommodate uh, some of what the, the debtor uh, will come forward with. But in the end, they are looking at their interest. That's why they made this investment. From where you sit, um, what do you see in terms of debt servicing ahead, specifically related to the Eurobond and facilitating our debt? Isaac. Kofi Ajay, well, did, can, did you get can that? You can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Yeah, first of all, we must we must note that some of the original, you know, holders of our bonds have already traded them off. So you are going to deal with a new set of creditors. Mm. But if you look at the debt servicing ahead for in the euro bond market, for the next ten years, we are looking um, at uh, close to eight billion dollars of loans that will be maturing in the next ten years. There was a chart that you showed. If you can show it again, uh, in 2023, which is this year alone, we have about 148 uh, million of those bonds maturing just this year. Interest rate is still rising. And just like Prof. DeVore mentioned, uh, 30 to 40 percent is, is really high. And we know a number of countries that are still in, at court, sorry, in court with um, you know, some of these countries that attempted debt restructuring, and they want their monies back. Because that was not the arrangement you you actually, how do you call it, uh, agreed with them. And once you start to to act as if you are imposing a certain uh, form of uh, what you want or magnitude of haircut, then they will they will take you on. At the beginning of the year, we had the finance minister. He made a very categorical statement that the finance ministry or the government was not so sure the magnitude of haircut that the investor community or the external creditors or commercial creditors were willing to take. And we heard of 30% initially. That was, that was the first impression we got when the deputy finance minister spoke about the external restructuring. Now we've seen additional 10 percentage points added to the initial target of 30. Now they are looking close to between 30 to 40. So it tells you that once we keep delaying with the external debt restructuring, we may have to request for even higher magnitude in the in the haircut because at the beginning you're looking for 30 now because you've delayed and your your debt servicing obligation and things are not really going on well you are adding additional te, um, you know 10 percent and just like professor mensa said when you delay some of these things will, 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 will come at you and you need that fiscal space to breathe so once you keep delaying then it means you need to go ahead to impose, you know, higher ha haircuts. We've seen that, okay, in the domestic markets where we thought, um, you know, just first round would be okay. But as we speak, we are looking at a third round. And if we don't take care, if we don't do the restructuring or debt rework at the external level really well, we may have to go back in the next 
month, six months or a year again requesting for additional haircuts. Those are interesting points you make. Professor Mensah, are you in agreement with Isaac on those points? And you look at, he mentions the magnitude of the haircut and now we're, we're adding uh, another extra 10 uh, percentage points. Now, is this going to lead to our getting priced out of the market? Currently, we can't access, you know, the creditor market internationally. We're seeking a haircut. But in this instance, looking into the future, is it going to price us out of the market? What will the consequences be, Professor Mensah? Yeah, we've already been priced out. I mean, this is a market, the last time we visited the market was somewhere around 2022, uh, January. So uh, we've been priced out already. But then, you know, um, as to whether we'll be able to go back to the market or not, it has to do with, you know, how we utilize, you know, the fiscal space that will be created after the debt restructuring. And uh, I'm praying, I mean, that administration upon administration should be able to utilize that fiscal space. Because if you are indirectly saving, I mean, for instance, on a domestic market, about 61 billion, it means it, it reduces your debt service by that margin. And when you um, you go for the external market you know, restructuring and you, you hit the same target, then it tells you that um, at least over 120 billion will be something that will be indirectly saved, which at the end of the day will enhance you know, the country's you know, debt service capacity. And if we are to utilize that space very well, be able to, you know, grow the economy in a direction where our export will be increasing. Um, we should be able to build up into our external debt service capacity. And that will go a long way to improve our ability. And by so doing, we'll open up the market for us again. So I would say that, you know, for us to have access to the market, um, we may have to utilize the fiscal space that will be created as a result of, you know, the debt restructuring very well. Um, I'll come to Prof. Professor Gachi with the same question. But before I do, Professor Mensa, a quick top up. Um, is this going to end up leading to an extension of the duration of our IMF program, do you think? Well, um, for, you see, if you are managing a country and the, your fiscal space keeps on reducing and ability to maneuver tends to reduce, obviously, you may want to continue with what will give you that free space. You know, IMF tends to give us that kind of credibility. And trust me, without the IMF's presence, you know, going all the way to the market ourselves to renegotiate our debt would have been something, you know, different. And so if we think, you know, being with IMF is what is going to give us that leverage of, you know, fiscal space, then um, probably we may be better off extending you know, the, 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 the facility to more than the three years that we're looking at. So it has to do with, you know, um, the fiscal space that we are looking at and then, you know, the leverage that we are enjoying. I mean, the three billion itself that IMF is giving us is, is, is something, you know, that will not necessarily change, you know, the, the, the situation in Ghana. But then that kind of soft, you know, collateral that we are getting from IMF, which has to do with their backing, in you know having access to the international market and all those um, is something that we can take advantage of. So um, from where I sit, yeah, there's a possibility that uh, the program can be extended. W would it would it be a step in the right direction to attempt to you know extend it? Well, sequentially, if you look at our history and relationship with the IMF, I mean, we always stick to the timelines in our first engagement with them. It won't be bad to look at something um, of that sort where we can extend the facility. You know, before we even exited IMF in 2018, 2019, there about, some of us were requesting that the economy is in the right trajectory. And as a result of that, why don't we extend, you know, um, the relationship or the kind of engagement so that the economy will be in its footing for some time? But look at what happened. Immediately we exited the IMF. It turns out that we are free to do whatever we want, and that's, that has brought us back to, you know, the situation that we find ourselves in now, where we had to visit the IMF again. So if we can go out of the norm, I mean, and then extend the facility, just to look at what will happen in our, you know, I mean, uh, economic space, 
Uh, it will be a step in the right direction. I won't, I won't, I won't make comments on that. Mm. Professor Gachi, so the same set of questions to you as well, starting from pricing out. We can't, we are not on the international, you know, borrowing market and, and for good reason. We all know why. That is why we're seeking this IMF uh, program. What price out effects or knock on effects could this have for us, for our economy moving forward? And then there is also the issue of the IMF. Would it be realistic? Would it be in our interest to extend the duration to be able to deal with some, uh, some of these shortfalls? What's your take? Yeah, before I come to that, let me briefly talk about the complication about the delay in achieving external uh, creditor uh, agreement. Sure. Uh, you see, some of the commercial debts are tradable. And when they, they, they trade the debt, and if we are unfortunate uh, for the debt to go into the hands of those that we call virtual investors, uh, if those people let hold on our debt, become the new uh, holders of, the, of those uh, debt instruments, uh, the way they treat these issues is different from the way multilateral and, uh, you know, uh, people, uh, uh, investors treat the debt, uh, and that will, will, will be very devastating for the economy. But but are there not mechanisms? Are there not mechanisms in place in you know the situation that Ghana finds itself, where maybe creditors or lenders should be restricted when it comes to selling off debt to such parties when you have a country on the ropes like like Ghana does? Are, are there no international regulations on that? their investors, period. Mm. So, so we, we ought to be very uh, careful about where we are going. Uh, if not so, uh, Argentina uh, issues will happen to us, and then some of our price assets uh, may be attached in the future. These are the fears that uh, I can talk about now. Now, uh, you see, it is too early to talk about extension of uh, IMF program. We are barely thinking about the second tranche in the first year. Uh, we should be focusing on how we'll be able to uh, achieve all the targets that we have on the, on, on the program. Uh, when we get to the tail end and we see that uh, we are not achieving some of the targets and extension of the program will help us achieve that, then we can talk about extension. But I believe that talking about extension of IMF program at this point in time is too early in the day, and uh, we should be focusing on the terms of the, of the agreement and the benchmark that have been set for, for, for the various sector, for the various areas of the, of, of the program. And I also believe that uh, we should be talking about uh, the importance of growth uh, and the importance of how we can bring back productivity. Because remember, if you're doing debt sustainability analysis and you are looking at the fiscal indicators, you will come across uh, exports. So we need to be working towards how we can ex expand our export base how we can get into new uh, destinations with our export, how we can bring on board uh, a new uh, export commodities that we are not yet uh, putting on the international market. That is very important to, to be able to uh, rip in, uh, rip in uh, uh, or moderate uh, the uh, external uh, uh, fiscal vulnerabilities. Then again, we need to be talking about growth uh, and growth comes with productivity. We need to create, we need to be working to, I mean, create the environment for growth to take place because you need growth to, I mean, to tame uh, debt to GDP ratio, for example. You need, you, need, you need growth to actually get the revenue that you need. You need growth to do almost everything. So if we are discussing all these things, we doubt focusing on these key areas. Uh, I think that that will not be helpful. Uh, so. Uh, uh, my conclusion is that we are priced out of the international debt market. That, that is not uh, forever. Uh, when we work our way right, uh, we get our fiscals right, 
uh, we get our growth momentum right, we will get back to the debt market. But we should also have in our mind that nobody will learn to us just because, merely because the IMF is with us. Because if you go for, let's say, a 10-year bond, uh, largely the investor knows that the IMF will not be with you uh, before maturity. So all those things will be priced into uh, the decision that the investor makes. I believe the investor doesn't look at only today and the past uh, to take decision about his investment. He will look at the future. Uh, so what I think we should be doing now is how to focus on achieving the terms of the IMF program. Mm. Uh, Professor Mensa, for you, from where you sit, what will be the knock-on effect of some of these original bondholders selling their coupons to uh, some of these other parties? You've heard Professor Gachi talk about the voucher lenders or creditors. What's your take on that? And how, and how dangerous is it for, for Ghana? Professor Mensa, you'd have to unmute, please. Right. So um, we are looking at um, bonds and the conditions attached to it. Um, if you're an investor and you purchase uh, um, a bond on the market, you understand that probably the risk that goes with it and the returns that is expected of, you know, the bond. So this will not change. But then as an investor, if you put yourself in the, in the, in the investment, then obviously we are looking at behavioral issues where, you know, an investor will say, I'm not ready to um, accept the 40% that is being accepted, uh, that is being proposed by, you know, um, the, the, the government of the day. So, um, if you look at it carefully, um, the investor, you know, sentiment will play a major role when the bond changes hands. Uh, but then, um, I don't think that will be much of a, a major problem because the bond has its own tenure. It has it, which builds up into the risk that the bond, you know, comes with. It has, you know, the issuer has not changed. Um, our economy, as we speak now, has deteriorated, and of course, our ability to service the debt has gone down. So if you're an investor and you are buying such a bond, um, you should know the possible I mean, repercussions and then the exposures that you may have. So um, I would say that the investor community, when it comes to our external space, you know, is they are sophisticated investors. They understand the market very well. And that is why in my earlier submission, I mentioned that they know there are losses in investment and there are gains in investment. Those investors don't just count their losses. They look at their extreme loss. And so the questions they will be asking themselves is what is the extreme situation? What is the downside level of risk that you know, they are likely to be exposed to? And having that in play, knowing very well that if the country should go into trouble completely, you may lose your money, you know, without necessarily recouping the money back as expected. And remember, you know, these monies are people's pensions, they are people's, you know, uh, what we call it, investment, real estate investment and other things that have been, some part of it have been, you know, have found its way into, you know, our, you know, um, 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 bond space. And so, you know, the portfolio manager who is sitting out there looking into Ghana will prefer to have as quick as possible, you know, um, um, I mean, debt rework. And so that, you know, the debt service can continue to operate. And let me tell you one thing. If you look at the percentage of all allocations that portfolio managers do, I mean, from Europe and other parts of the world, looking at investment in Africa, they don't do more than 5% of their portfolios in Africa. Yes, if you look at the numbers clearly. And so if you are in, I mean, portfolio manager and you are sitting out there and less than 5% of your investment, you know, is about to go on default. I mean, obviously you, you will not have that kind of um, hold up when it comes to, you know, negotiations. And that is why I'm saying that there's a likelihood of, you know, having a quick, you know, debt rework and whether the investment changes hands or not, I mean, the space is the same. 
uh, the quick, quick, of quick, the investor is quick, the same. Quick intervention. So we're, not have, we're not going to have much, you know, problem mm. when it comes to, you know, the debt um, restructuring. Whether it, 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 it somebody buys it or, I mean, um, uh, a vulture or um, uh, what do we call it? Um, Whether it's a vulture uh, or a chicken. investor buys it or not. <laughs> right. I don't think we may have that, that much of a problem. Okay, so uh, vulture or chicken, it's going in our way. But, but you look at the fact that some of these lenders or creditors are also owed by other countries, also on the ropes in the emerging you know, market, for example, emerging countries market. You look at the South American countries, you look at even some Asian countries, we've seen them uh, largely affected. W will things still be the same? Because some of these same creditors could be lending to some of these entities. W what then would that mean? Would it be as easy peasy as you make it, you know, seem? You know, like I said, um, if you study international investment and uh, bond allocations, I mean, I have friends who work in Switzerland and were made at uh, the university at the time. And they, they tell me that, yes, for African bonds and the emerging market bonds, I mean, clearly, I mean, they know the risk, right? And they know the premium they also enjoy out of the risk. And uh, they were not prepared to invest more less than more than 5% of their portfolio in African bonds. So, um, and you know, per portfolio analysis and allocations, there's always a room for extreme situations. And 5% is the is the is the maximum they can accommodate, you know, on their balance sheet. So the pressure is not that much on them. And that is why I believe. Um, they, we, we can easily get, you know, um, um, a deal, I mean, on this external debt restructuring. Professor Gachi, now our securities have posted some of the worst performances, uh, you know, on the international indexes, especially when you're looking at emerging markets like ours. What is the possibility then of securing some agreement with our uh, commercial debtors by end of year? If you put this, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the fact that by end of year, we want to reach some sort of agreement. How practical is it? Well, I, I will not put uh, a date on that because this is not the first time we are hearing that we have clinched a deal with them. Uh, only to realize that we have not. Uh, even the initial statement that the finance minister made at uh, Morocco, uh, it sounds as if that everything <laughs> was sealed. Uh, it is only after a few days that we start realizing that we are now reworking very hard uh, to uh, ensure that we achieve that. Uh, so it is very difficult to, uh, to put a date on that. We only hope that it comes as fast as possible uh, and when that happens, um, that will also take some pressure away from uh, uh, from us, and that will rework the the instrument. And I believe that they will receive uh, uh, good ratings uh, as we go along, uh, because that is also very important for our domestic debt management. That is also very important for the outlook of our instrument. Uh, in the international market, so that so that is what I can say about uh, 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 this. But it is not good to put uh, a date on it as uh, we keep changing goalposts uh, along the line. Uh, Professor Mensah, I'll put that same question to you: the Emer emerging markets index and you know the slump of or, or our performance so far. Will that impact maybe our goal of securing by end of year some deal with our commercial creditors? Right. So um, when it comes to um, um, some of these agreements and economic dynamics, I'm careful when I'm, 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 I'm going out with numbers. I mean, um, because it has to do with, I mean, human behavior. And you don't know what the mind will tell somebody tomorrow. So effectively, um, to be spe uh, to say specifically, uh, can you know we can have a deal by the end of the year or not? You know, when you split our creditor space into two, uh, we have bilateral, you know, creditors, and then we have you know commercial creditor, which forms the euro bond market, and that, that 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 group are quite a complex group. I mean, let me let me put it that way because of the the kind of I mean investment they are holding. I mean, these are people's money, you know. 
But then when it comes to the bilateral, you know, um, credit uh, agreement, uh, those ones are more or less block, you know, negotiations. And it's easy to have a deal with them. And that is why if you read, you know, the finance minister's statement for the, um, the, the, the bilateral, you know, debt, they are looking at somewhere in November. And then for the Eurobond and those complex ones, which has several investors with their demands and different, you know, I mean, look into the whole investment, you know, that they have. Um, they are looking at end of the year, but we, we should we should be careful because I mean we are now going into negotiations and you know the like, like I said the finance minister shouldn't look at the process as we he did in the in the local market because the local market the investors were tied I mean and looking at our pensions regulations and the investment space the investor had no alternative you know use of his money but than to stick to the, the debt restructuring but when it, go, it comes to the international market you know the investor have a bigger space and uh, the little thing that you do you can you know i mean um raise that kind of disinterest you know from your bonds when you uh, you are negotiating with uh, this external creditor so uh, we shouldn't go by the same approach we should appreciate that yes of course it will take a lot of information i mean release of information let the creditor know the true stand of the of the Ghanaian economy and um, over time i think we should be able to get a deal with them i would say end of the year uh maybe too quick but um we hope and if it happens like that it will be i mean beneficial to all of us so uh, we hope that uh, we get something of that sort Gentlemen, to wrap off, uh, to cap off the conversation, your quick thoughts on moving forward, what your expectations are by end of year leading into the first quarter of next year. As far as Ghana's fortunes in this regard, our creditors. I'll start with you, Isaac Kofiaji. Well, ben, let, let me say that uh, Ghana will in the future become a template for other countries also seeking for commercial um, you know restructuring and so i see the eurobond creditors they will be very careful because whatever you you give to ghana you have other countries also coming to you asking for restructuring and so they'll be very very careful and measured in the kind of haircuts they give to ghana because you give ghana 40 another country will come asking for 50 another poorer country will come asking for maybe 60 and they, they will be very careful. They will make sure that uh, they are at equilibrium because the assurance we are talking about is not just from the, um, you know, the, the person who has borrowed, but also from the, the creditor as well. So the Eurobond creditors, they need assurance from us. We also need assurances also from them. And so I see them being, being very careful in the magnitude of haircut that they will give to Ghana because whatever that they will do, Will probably be a template for other countries to follow just like the way we refer to zambia when we are talking about restructuring of chinese you know loans and so there's opportunity cost uh, for both ends and then i know that the eurobond creditors and even ghana as well we all be looking for that equilibrium to make sure that we all don't lose an amount that we can't afford to maybe lose so i would say that they will be very measured and just like the props have already said both props it to be a complex negotiation for for ghana and just like you know other countries have uh, attempted this whole thing and are facing legal issues if we don't take care we may have to we, we may have to really you know um escalate this whole issue if we don't really tackle the situation well Interesting, interesting perspectives. Uh, I saw Professor Gachi and Professor Mensah nodding along the way. Uh, what would be your take, uh, Professor Gachi? Well, uh, as I said, um, the investor will not say because he has enjoyed premium. Therefore, he wants to trade the premium for the loss today. That is the incentive available for the investor when he entered into the market. The investor will be looking at what you are proposing today to him and look at perhaps the present value of that and see whether he's comfortable with it. So that is why we are going to be trending. And that is the more reason why we, we are divided the investors into two, multilateral, they will be flexible, etc. 
but we have what we call investor characteristics. The other ones in the commercial sector, uh, their characteristics is not the same as the multilateral ones. So that is what we're going to be seeing. And, and then I, I also think that uh, uh, if necessary uh, for, for this deal to be uh, um, uh, signed uh, within time, uh, the, the government should also be looking at revising uh, uh, what is put in on the table uh, for, for, for these deals to be signed. As you, you mean as revising the 40% haircut? Is that what you mean? Of course, of course. Since uh, the creditors are uh, actually refusing uh, this um, uh, term, it is only proper that you go back to the table with something that is uh, uh, more acceptable. From where you sit, what would of be course, more acceptable? Of course, it's, go it, it's going to be a win-win situation. From where uh, you say it should be, it should be a win for the investors, and it should be a win for the economy of Ghana. What would be more practical? What what percentage of a haircut would be more practical? From where you say? I don't know what the investors will be looking at. We are talking about principle here, but if if I want to give you a rate or a percentage, uh, that means that I'm just looking at targets. <laughs> so. Uh, the government will work out a target that is more acceptable to the investor community uh, uh, to accept. Uh, Professor Mensah, you have the final word. Yes, so um, I'll put myself in the shoes, sorry. I'll, I'll put myself in the shoes of uh, a typical Eurobond investor who is looking at how he can retrieve his uh, restructured you know, bonds. And... Um, Government is not looking at anything beyond uh, below 2030. So effectively, um, if government should restructure the bond, um, at what level, I mean, would the government be able to consistently or sustainably pay my, you know, debt after the restructured, you know, has restructuring has taken place? That is what the investor should look at, because. If you don't look at it that way and then you squeeze the government to a point where you force them to restructure at a level where they will not be able to service your restructured debt, you will end up, you know, I mean, facing another restructuring or possibly even default. So, um, like I said earlier, the investor's knowledge, you know, the investment space, knowledge is important and knowledge has to do with information. The investment, you know, space, knowledge as far as our external creditors is concerned when it comes to investment is completely different from the Ghanaian environment. And, you know, um, I believe, I believe that, you know, the investor who is sitting out there will be able to, by this time they've done all the numbers and then, you know, um, they are ready to hit a point where, you know, they, they know very well that our government after the restructuring will be able to service its debt um, rather than squeezing the government to maybe do a debt restructuring of about, you know, 10 percent in the right. nominal asset and still have no room to, you know, service the debt after the debt restructure. So it has to do with a convergent point. Our government may want to do more. I mean, if you give the government a chance, I mean, if you, they may want to even do 50 percent, even to make more room, I mean, to to have money to even run elections going forward. But you know, the investor also foresee this risk, you know, the possibility of overspending, you know, when we get into elections and all those. So by so doing, they may not want to squeeze the government so much to a level where, you know, government may restructure, but at the end of the day, will not be able to service, you know, its debt. Well, only time will tell what the creditors will decide. Of course, they'll be looking at their interest, and it is merely on compassionate grounds. Uh, also, for the reason of ensuring that they can get something rather than nothing uh, from these investments uh, they have made. But thank you, gentlemen, for joining the conversation. Isaac Ophir J is a data analyst here with us at Joy News. Professor John Gachi, of course, is dean of the UCC School of Business. And then we also had Professor uh, Lord Mensa, who is with the University of Ghana Business School, a finance lecturer. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. You're welcome, thank you. sir. All right. You're welcome. So that's been the first belt of our conversation, but we go now to talk about the National Union of Ghana students. Uh, there's been a leadership change, and of course we'll be telling you all about it. The term of Apia Labi is over and Nukes is now being headed by Treme Opong Daniel. But what does he envisage? What does the status 
uh, when it comes to the student front in Ghana at that level, how can leadership be made better and how can the ordinary student at that level get better? Well, we'll be having that discussion up next on the AM show with Bernice of Read Lancer. Do stay.